when Done. do we need to shut this down okay thank you everyone thank you for being here uh, especially it's especially on a monday morning and i was telling someone just now that it ought to be illegal to get up so early on monday morning <laughs> okay but um, especially because uh, Monday mornings are precious for me because after a full Sunday and by the time I'm actually done on Sunday uh, and I can actually be relaxed I'm it's about 4 in the morning on Monday you know and I would, been, I would have been awake for 23 hours already so, so Mondays I I don't want I don't care about the alarm clock or anything if I I just sleep I sleep and until I wake up all right so I used to hate the pastors conferences and meetings <laughs> on the schedule on Monday because we we do have a full Sunday uh, even if we don't have a second service sometimes there's a, it's not just fellowship there's a lot of other things sometimes we're talking to members uh, we could be at someone's home I've left someone's home at four in the morning before on Monday you know, so it can be quite crazy. All right. But anyway, um, let's start. We are supposed to break for lunch at 12. No, we uh, hmm? Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just want to be sure because, uh, okay. Anyway, um, what time is it? Okay. All right, I just want to make sure that we, I don't derail the conference as far as the scheduling is concerned and all that. Okay, so um, let's do this. Um, I'm, we're going to be in two places. I just want to uh, first turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, at the same time, can you turn to, just put a bookmark or something on Acts chapter 20. All right, and we're going to go back to Acts chapter 20 in a short while. But let's begin uh, just to kick things off. All right, and we already kind of started yes, uh, on Saturday and and sun, uh, Sunday. All right, just to kind of lay some preliminaries, and uh, so we're going to uh, get into this this morning. So let's all stand, and uh, we're going to read Second Timothy chapter four, um, the f first eight verses, and we'll do this responsively. All right, we'll do this. Uh, responsively so beginning verse 1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my cause. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. All right, may God bless us the reading of His Word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning as we begin even on the first day of this conference. And Lord, we thank you for even all the uh, preaching that has been already been laid down even the last two days. I pray you help us to start off uh, today on the right foot uh, with a, a clear and sound exposition of your Word. Lord, that everything that we say and do and that we believe and we practice is based on a solid foundation of your word. And Father, I pray and ask also for our hearts to be tender, our minds to be thinking and engaged, to ponder the things that we have heard, to search out the truth uh, in, in, in by searching the scriptures. And then Lord, I ask for your empowerment. Fill me with thy spirit, Lord, that uh, I can be a suitable instrument 
that can be used to minister to your faithful here. Thank you, Lord, for those who are here. We pray for those who are, uh, will be joining us later today and, and this evening. Lord, I pray your, our heart and our attention will be to your word and what you have to say. And then, Lord, open our eyes of understanding. Show us, Lord. And then, I just pray you will just fill me with all power. That it's not going to be, all this will be done with the might and the power of man or with the wisdom of man or with the eloquence of man but Lord with the power of God so if we submit to you to your word and to what your word has to say and we commit this time to you in Christ's name we pray Amen please be seated right now many of us are familiar with final words the dying words of or the final words of a dying person. How many of us notice that the final words of a person who is about to depart or leave or whatever, to leave this world, to leave this life, uh, are always focused on the important things. Right? Uh, they are not focused on the mundane things like remember to take out the trash. Merely remember to clear, clear, clean up your room, right? Do the laundry. No, 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 no. They, what, do they, what, do, what do we hear people say? Things that are truly important in this life, right? So much so that, um, and there will be a lot of drama also because why? you notice as an actor, one of the best role to play is always a dying death scene. Okay, with the exception, I think I just saw the news a few days ago, there was someone uh, who said he was, had had enough because he's died 38 times in front of the camera and he, and he told his agent, no more, I'm not going to do any more dying roles. All right, I've never watched him die on, uh, in front of the screen, so I, I have no idea. But usually they want to play that because right, it's very powerful, very dramatic. Right, because it gets our attention. And as we look at this, I want to see here that whether it's in 2 Timothy chapter 4 or Acts chapter 20, now Paul lays out his final words to the people that he loves, right? Writes them to the churches that he, he has started and to the brethren, and he wants to warn them, to encourage them, to challenge them about what is truly important. So in other words, these are words that we must take heed and pay attention to Okay, because it's not, he's not talking about something unimportant. They are very high priority. And here, he begins Acts chap, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1, with these words, I charge thee therefore. All right, this is written in continuation from the last three chapters. Right, chapter 3, he warns about the perilous times that shall come. And, you know, by the time you get to 2 Timothy, you're going to see Paul in 2 Timothy was dealing with warning after warning after warning. He's dealing with issue after issue after issue. Why? Because already in that first century, there were a lot of challenges facing New Testament churches. Okay? And that by chapter 3, he tells us that how that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Dangerous, treacherous, right? Difficult times. And you know, that's been pretty much the case for the last 2,000 years. So when he comes to verse 1, he says, I charge thee therefore. This was a solemn charge to Timothy. He says, Timothy, you need to pay attention. You need to take this very seriously. He says, and I'm going to say this to you, and I will hold you accountable before God and the Lord Jesus Christ for whether or not you do this. That sounds important. Right? We, we give a solemn charge whenever we ordain someone. And here he says, okay, before God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom? All right, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to judge, right? Since the quick, referring to what? The living, right? And the dead, right? 
Do you realize he's also going to judge and to deal with what? Not just the loss, but there will be an accounting f- for the saints as to whether what we did was in this life, in this body was good or bad because there will be rewards or the loss of rewards. And so he tells Timothy as a young pastor, he says, look, you are going to take this very seriously. What, were the, what was his instructions? Verse 2. Preach the word. Amen. Right? Now, the problem that we, with verse 2 has been that in our Baptist church culture, we hear only the words, preach the word, we go amen, but we forget about what that involves. Amen. Right? It's to declare the word of God. How? When? The first part says, be instant in season, out of season. When are the two times you're supposed to do this? In season, out of season. Right now it's what? Rainy season. What follows after that will be the dry season, which is also the tourist season. Whether it's rainy season or dry season, we do it. Whether it is politically correct or politically incorrect, we declare the word of God. Whether it is popular or not, we declare it. Whether your friend likes it or not, we declare it. Why? Because it is not your opinion. It is the word of God. You see, the I don't I don't know about you. Okay, I I I don't like public speaking. To be honest, all right, I don't like to make speeches. If you want to see me kind of being a bit tongue-tied and awkward, uh, look, wait for my, when members decide to celebrate my birthday, I don't do speeches. Why? Because I am not about my opinions and what I have to say. Okay? And uh, I know some of the men here, the, the preachers, if you're teaching or preaching, listen, you may be a shy introvert, it's Okay? But just remember one thing, when we come up here and we declare and preach the word of God, it's not about what you have to say. And because of that, we can be bold, we can be loud or soft whenever necessary. Why? Because it's the word of God, it's got nothing to do with me. Okay? Now, you and I need to worry when we are coming up here and we're talking about, here's what I think, here's my philosophy, here's how my viewpoint. But here is this preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. All right? It doesn't matter when, there's no such thing as well. Here's the best time now. now. Now's not the right time to say this. Okay? There is a right timing as the Lord will lead. But this is not based on considerations uh, involving men. Okay? And we are coming, fast coming to the days, whether in, the, in public, as far as the lost world out there, right, from a secular viewpoint is concerned or from even among the, the, the network of churches that there are many things are gradually becoming out of bounds that you're not supposed to preach about this, you're not supposed to say anything about this lest you offend somebody. One of the first things that, uh, okay, my pastor told me when I was a young believer, all right, you, some of you will know who he is because he's the father of our sister Esther. He told me this. He reminded me this, that the prophets of old mostly walked alone. Don't be afraid to be alone. Don't be afraid that you, you may have to stand alone. Don't be afraid that you're going to lose your friends. He says, be instant in season. Right? And then, out of season. Now, how do we preach? There are three things, okay? Four aspects here that we need to look at. It says, reprove, rebuke, exhort. What was the last one? It was the fourth one. It says, with all long suffering and doctrine. Okay? In other words, reprove, rebuke, exhort, in what way? Patiently. Right? Long suffering. Be patient. Don't lose heart. Keep doing this. But it says, what is the basis? It has to be Bible doctrine. 
It has to be from the Bible. It has to be based on chapter and verse. You see, the problem that we, I see today is that there is, yes, a lot of very powerful preaching, but no doctrine, no Bible, no doctrine, no teaching. And this is what we need to have. It has to be this, because every few years, you're going to see that if you just want to hear very rousing preaching, look for the presidential elections. Okay, it's coming up, right? I, you know, Donald Trump is go, getting ready for re-election. Uh, there's a whole bunch of Democrats and, 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 and other Republicans that are going to run. And, you know, I was amazed to hear previously how some of these candidates can get up there and, wow, boy, can they deliver a message. No Bible, because why? They're politicians. Yeah. Here it says, preach, what? The word of who? The word of God, not the word of man. Yeah. All right? Most of the time, here's what happens, is that we get very loud, rousing preaching from second or third opinions Rather than from second of you know second Timothy of first Thessalonians. Right? And the thing is that we quote okay, one of the reasons why I get a bit nervous about being quoted is that sometimes the things that we may end up quoting people more than we quote the scriptures. Okay? Now uh, just just to say that, okay, I'm not offended because someone quoted me uh, yesterday. Alright? But it's just that uh, don't make it a habit because you always put the word of God first. Amen. Now, it says you have preached the word, be instant in season, out of season. Now, reprove. What is reproof? You point out, right? You identify, you mark out for the purpose of what? Correction. Okay? Now, I was sharing this during breakfast. Now, in the military, when we, when we have our training, now, there are times that we actually do live firing and all that, and we do fire live bullets. We, uh, the artillery guys may actually lock and fire live uh, mortar rounds, and those things are dangerous. Okay, one of them landing right in the middle of this room here could send everybody to hospital, or we may end up just with body parts. Okay, now, what happens sometimes is that they land, especially during rainy season or whatever, in the mud, boop, and it doesn't explode. Now, we're training around the area, and we're firing, and that becomes dangerous. So what do we do? We actually will mark the area with white tape, put a ring around that, so that nobody will accidentally stumble into that. Because once you see that, it says you, are, you stay far away. All right? Once we identify, we stay far away, there is a separation. And then finally, they will send in uh, usually the combat engineers to destroy that, okay, to get rid of that. That's an elimination. Now, reproof is important because it needs to point out where there is error. Okay, where there is error. Now, the problem with reproof today is that among the independent fundamental Baptists, this has become out of season, yeah. extremely unpopular. Why? Because the majority of churches, we have now shifted to a positive-only type of Christianity. Which, here's the problem. You cannot support that uh, the chapter and verse because if you just take only the positive parts of the Bible, you, got a, you have a very thin Bible. Okay, now, some years back, I, I heard about this. Someone, there was a publisher that tried to publish a positive Bible. So they put in all the positive verses of the Bible in, compiled that, and it was a very thin Bible. Because, right, the, the Word of God is full of warnings. Why? Yeah. To point out things that are important to us and where there is a danger. All right? Now, how many of us realize here that, I mean, as a parent, you and, you and I know this because, right, we give a lot of warnings to our children. Be careful, watch your step here, you know. If I just decide to step out like that, I could fall or stumble. Right? Um, what happens with, with children? I mean, 
there could be a hole in the ground. You don't just say, ah, it's okay, you know, whatever. We, we warn. All right, sometimes we may have to put an obstacle there to uh, prevent the children from going there, okay, which works with little g- girls, but not with boys, because when you put an obstacle there, they treat it as a suggestion. It's an obstacle to conquer. Okay, but we put those warnings there, reproof. There are warnings. Warnings for the sake of safety. Okay. Now, I realized this very early on uh, in our church and as a young pastor also, uh, and also when I was under training, that m- many Baptists today dislike reproof. And, and when there are articles, whatever, the, you know, the most unpopular articles, we, we print out booklets, whatever, with things that, that members can take home to read and study for themselves and that will profit them. The, most, the ones that don't get, usually uh, they're taken the least are the ones that have reproof in them. And you see, and, and especially in the 20th century, we moved to where our focus is on a devotional style Christianity where we just want that few verses that, oh, I like this so much, I, you know, I'm going to just read and uh, memorize all these verses because these are my favorite verses. And, and it's a soft, effeminate Christianity. Okay? This is further supported today by the music we sing. Because when you, got, when you move on to the 20th century onwards, the, the, the type of hymns and songs that we sing, okay, the themes have shifted again towards a softer, more, oh, how I love Jesus, you know, kind of thing. Where before it was what? We fight, right? We, we, faith is the victory. We overcome. But the themes change. Okay, and one of the reasons for that was um, in our modern era, in the last hundred years or so, the, the, the majority of songwriters also they shifted from being men to women for a softer, more sentimental, emotional feel. I'm not saying that women shouldn't write songs, but you know what? Fanny Crosby didn't write that kind of stuff. Here, reproof is important, but what was the second thing? Rebuke. Okay, this is a sterner warning, all right? And, 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 and uh, uh, when we rebuke, there is obviously correction involved. And then we have what? To exhort, which is to come alongside someone, to encourage them. Now, two out of three, have you noticed, are negative? You see, you and I don't get to pick and choose which parts of the Bible we want. Here, many will say, well, you see, Pastor, uh, you need to be more encouraging. Uh, Sometimes we actually need to be warning people more. Okay? What you, you and I as members have to do is we need to pray and make sure that the Lord will continue to give the pastor good discernment as to when to reprove, when to rebuke, and when to exhort. But what we are in battle with is that when there is a man-centered mentality, okay, remember we were dealing with this yesterday, right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? One of the big issues in the church in Corinth was that because of its man-centeredness, right, it's um, that human reasoning and thinking and, and wisdom was at the center and was the guide for everything instead of the wisdom of God. Human reasoning is, well, I think if we were more kind to everyone and that we were gentle and we we're positive only, we'll be able to attract more people to come to church. You know, they would like the message. I guarantee you one thing, the message of the gospel, will, if it's a biblical message, will always offend a lost person. Yeah. It will. Okay, but we what we are in battle with today, and we're in battle with it sometimes within our own churches, 
I've, I've, if there's one area that has actually caused us a lot of problems, it came from the crowd that wanted a positive only faith. That wanted this, Pastor, when we come on Sunday, your job is to make us feel good about ourselves. It's not my job to make you feel good. You want to feel good, go buy ice cream. <laughs> Seriously, I'll join you. All right. You want, me, you want me to feel good? Buy me a steak. Okay? I like it medium rare. But, you see, the thing is, it's not about feeling good. The, where does the joy come from? It comes from the joy of the Holy Spirit. But, you see, we've come to where we want these things as a substitute for the missing Holy Spirit of God because joy comes from within. Hey, do you realize that, oh, we're supposed to uh, feel good, to be encouraged and all that, right? I come on Sunday to recharge, to refill. Now, that's the philosophy of ministry. That's the philosophy for what church and, and worship is on Sunday today. That's the modern redefinition. What were we told in, uh, in Hebrews was what? That, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, what was the purpose? Was to exhort one another. You and I have a duty to a responsibility to one another that when we come to be an encouragement to others but now we come and say no pastor it's your job to entertain me to make me feel good we have taken everything and reversed it now when you preach the word you reprove you rebuke it doesn't mean that we get into the flesh and we are all about being mean and nasty to one another. What is the basis? We're all long-suffering. You see that? If I'm long-suffering with someone, what am I doing? I'm going to be pleading. I may give warning. I may have to uh, issue a stern rebuke. Now, how do we balance all this? Simple. How would you do it as a parent to a child? Right? It is love, but it's also tough love. Right? A father has to be firm, but he cannot be harsh and cruel. A lot of pastors are harsh and cruel in the name of standing for righteousness. Now, how do I learn that? It finally connected to me. Why? Because God gave me a wife and he gave me children and then he taught me through there and then I saw the connection with 1 Timothy chapter 3, when it talks about what? The qualifications of the pastor? Then I realized, oh, all that came together. Why? Because the kind of husband and the kind of father you are will determine the kind of pastor you will be and how you will treat the members. Why? Because yes, I have to reprove, rebuke and exhort. But you know something? As a father, I don't have the option to say, well, Reggie, you don't want to listen to what I say, you will not submit to me as pastor. Okay, you pack up your bags, you go. You, go. you don't come back. Yeah, I can't say that to my children. Do you, husbands, do you realize you can't say that to your wife? Yeah. Show me, even in the real world, when the sheep don't quite do what the shepherd wanted, he beats them to death. You're not going to see that. Yeah. But neither do they go, well, well, you know, you're right. You're also right. You can just do whatever you want. The sheep will get into trouble. They will get, you know, they will get into trouble. They'll hurt themselves in the process. Right? right? Our children will hurt themselves in the process. Right? We don't go around and say, well, okay, you want to play with this, right? It's okay. You can stick it up your nose. All right, and stick it in your ear. All right, it's okay. You can poke your sister in the eye. You know, if you feel good about it, yeah, just do it. Knock yourself out. We don't do that. Why? Because there is safety. There's danger involved. All right? Power soccer. Ah, it's okay. I can stick my two fingers in. I'll lick it and then see what happens. Who knows? I might, it might tingle all over. All right? Now, there is a balance, but it is always for what? The well-being 
of the sheep. Right? To preach not man's word, but God's word. All the time, whether it's fashionable or not. You know, in church culture, there are all sorts of trends and fashions. Okay? Among all the different churches. Okay? Even, interestingly, even at one point, even among the Pentecostals and Charismatics, suddenly, you know, the teaching of repentance and the proper use of the law in preparing a lost person for salvation, all that suddenly came in, into fashion again. Now, why? Because there are fads and there are fashions, and we'll see this in the next few verses. Now, it says, do all this with long suffering, but the basis must be Bible doctrine. Yeah. Right? Not the teachings of men. Jesus had a lot of issues with the Pharisees. Why? Because he said, full well, they reject the word of God, but what happens? They substitute instead for doctrines are the teachings of men. And we must, now, the, how do we protect ourselves from that? You and I have to become good, skilled students of the word of God. Yesterday, I talked about being skillful all right, and acquiring the skill in knowing and ascertaining what the will of God is for your life so that you can pursue it. One other fundamental of the faith in our walk is that we must be good students of the word of God. Not just in reading, but in searching out answers. Now, you should not, as a policy, should not just be that whenever there is a question, the only person who can answer that is, well, let's go ask pastor. It's good that you have that mindset that we should seek his counsel. We want to know what he thinks. But there are things that are so basic, so fundamental, that as a father or mother, you should be able to explain from the Bible to your own children. Amen. Then my question is how, how... Ask yourself just one basic question. How many of you have actually read this from cover to cover one time? One time. I'm not asking for much, just once in your life, before you die. Have you even read this one time from cover to cover? Much less, okay, how many times? No, we're not going into a competition here. But going through this a number of times over and over again will help you to have a better overview. But then searching out for answers, you know, one of the best things is this. Okay, okay, I'm going to share a secret here. Now, you know who is the one that benefits the most from a question and answer session? The one who's answering. Why? Sometimes, okay, Pastor said yesterday, short answer. Sometimes the short answer is, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> Let me go check it out. All right, I'll get back to you. All right, but of course, be honest as a teacher. You know what, go back, check it out. But once that pressure's on you that I, I need to go and figure this one out, I need to find the answers, you never forget. You will never forget the answer. Okay? Why? Because you had to search that out for yourself. It was not spoon-fed to you. Now, it is a very basic thing that every one of us should be able to help someone find answers from the Word of God. Okay? And here, the warning was this, for the time will come, verse 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine. We see this all the time, in, in especially these days when you get on Facebook and you, if there is a discussion, I, I hate getting into theological discussions online. It never leads anywhere. Okay? And after a while, it stops making sense. And the worst part is the most discouraging discussions, discussion groups? Pastors. Baptist pastors groups. It's the worst. I go in there just to, for research to figure out how crazy we've become. Okay? But that's it. I try not to say anything. Because after a while, if you wait, spend a lot of time in there, you, actually nothing is certain anymore. You don't know what Bible to use. You don't know what doctrine. You don't know how anyone gets saved. You know, you don't know anything. 
It's like that. What was that old song, that rock and roll song from the fifties? Don't know much about history. Don't know much about. Don't know much about theology. Don't know much about anything. And after a while, you don't even know what is what anymore. There's no f- clear line. And there is always you will see the reaction here. And this, this, that's why this is true. This is prophetic, and it's true of us today. Is that when you give the chapter and verse, they just dismiss it. Is it the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine? Okay, no, 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 I think it was a, a year and a half ago, whatever, there was someone who posted something, and this was, this was a Baptist preacher, and he used a picture, painting, David killing Goliath, and I, I pointed out, actually, just be careful, because that picture doesn't quite depict properly what the scriptures has to say. Then he said, all right, look, you know, I'm, I'm, you know I, I only go for the Bible, whatever, you know, you better give me chapter and verse, otherwise, you know, whatever. So I gave him chapter and verse, and then he blocked me. Okay. But you see, the time will come, they will not endure. They cannot stand it. Instead, this is but after their own lust, okay, so this is coming from, with, you have to realize the mechanics of this. This is not, oh, well, because they're deceived. It says, after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Their own lust. Oh, uh, pray for my son or my daughter. You know, they, they were full members in our church, whatever, but now, you know, they got, uh, they're going with this cult or this, whatever. You see, it is their own lust. And you have to ask why, because that is an issue of the heart. Okay, it's a heart condition. It says they shall heap. Now, what is heaping? Anyone pour, like pouring a lot of sugar into your coffee? That's a heap, right? When you build it up and then there's a whole pile of this. Adding more and more teachers. Why? Because every few years there is always a new teaching, a new doctrine. And sadly, among Baptists today, that's true. So, where once Jude pointed out the faith once delivered unto the saints, which was a settled faith, it is now an ever shifting and ever moving one. And so they have one teacher after another, a conference after conference, and book after book, whoever, to bring across those teachings. Now, what was the motivation? Because they have itching ears. They needed to hear more stuff. Now, I don't know about you, that, okay, whenever something itches, especially your ears, when something itches, it feels good to scratch it. Once you scratch it, oh, right? You know, one of the best things sometimes, okay, just a very quick tip, husbands and wives, you know, you have your time alone together or whatever, scratch each other's backs. Your wife will thank you for it. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, I feel good. You don't even have to be skillful at giving a massage. Just scratch the back. Right? Now, here, one of the most intense feelings that you can have is when you, your ear is itching, and some were what? They want to dig their ear or they, they you know, I, I, okay, our old custom, I, I remember my mom doing this was they use a chicken feather and when you strip away all, most of it and just that little tip and you go in, oh. Now, think about that sensation and then here is this, people out of the lust, they are seeking out all these new teachers, preachers, new doctrines to satisfy the itch. Now, it was interesting that uh, Hillsong, all right, when interviewed, they were asked why they were so successful. They said it's because we are able to scratch the right itch. Why? Because that demand was there. You see, it's very man-centered. Where the need is there, we're told. Okay, now in even among independent Baptist conferences, says what? You see the need, you meet the need. Be careful because that is, can be taken, it can go in a very man-centered direction. Here we see the, there was a very man-centered need. I have an itch. And what happens? 
I need to meet it. I need to find the right teachers, the right preachers, the right books, conferences, whatever, to scratch that need. Now, because, you look at verse 4, it says, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned onto fables. They will turn their way, their, away their ears from the truth. Now, we are in that type of thing today. In the last 10 years especially, this has become mainstream thinking in society. Uh, there was, I, I just saw some news yesterday, I think. There was a doctor, I think he got into trouble. They suspended his medical license because he told the patient, you are fat. You need to lose weight. Why? Because remember, reproof. What's the reproof? If you don't do something about it, your health will be affected. You could die prematurely. Now you're not allowed to say that because oh, you offended my feelings. You hurt my feelings and I am offended with you and you know you fat shame me and blah blah blah. You know, we are at the point where if you point that out, right? If you point out there's only two ways you can go to the toilet. Standing up or sitting down. Alright? The the fact that Jesus himself and the word of God says what? That from the beginning, God made what? Man and woman. Right? And marriage is defined as what? Man and woman, whatever. Oh, you cannot say that. You, you offend everybody else. Okay, this is they shall turn their ears from the truth. You, you can say what you like about gender, but it comes down to this. There's only. When you examine the genetics of it, there's XY chromosomes and double X chromosomes. All right? And the sex chromosomes don't lie. You can cosmetically change a lot of things. I agree. But you know something? You know who were the ones that started all this first? Christians. We baptize people as long as they self-identify as a born-again believer, you're not supposed to question that. You're not supposed to verify that. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, what does it say? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And the word teach there means to make disciples. Then it says baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Who is the them? that we're supposed to baptize? Disciples. Who are disciples? Those who have dedicated their lives in following their master. In this case, it's Jesus Christ. But somewhere along the way, we shifted that. So now what happens? We, see we baptize those who profess and you're not supposed to question that profession. Every time I ask a question, uh, where's the chapter and verse for that? Nobody can provide me one, but they will say I'm a false teacher for insisting on that. Where? Just do, you have your phone, you, you know, on your phone app, Strong's Concordance, look up the definition of teach there. Matateo, it means make disciples. And then the next part, baptize disciples. But what happens? Now it says they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Why? Because truth is always verifiable. Truth is unchanging. And there will be evidence to support that truth. If I came to you now and said, look, the last, since the, my last visit, which was about, what, five, six weeks ago, six weeks ago, I have lost 50 kilos in weight because I have a new diet. You'll be laughing because I think it's more likely I may have gained about half to one kilo just in the last six, six weeks. Where's the evidence of that claim? All right, where's the evidence? 
But today, you see, people turn their ears away from the truth and then shall be turned onto fables. All right? In other words, what happens now? Whatever I believe, right, whatever fairy tale, whatever I imagine, that is reality today. There is a rejection of reality. One good man, uh, one good preacher actually that I know, uh, was uh, I think it's about two years, one and a half years or two years back, actually told me over the phone, I said, you know what, Pastor, I think the problem with you is that you're too in love with reality. I was like, okay. But since when do we as New Testament churches and as pastors, right, dabble with fantasy and fables? Because reality, it must be based on facts, must be based on evidence, not based on what we think, what you and I think, what you and I imagine, or, or, or whatever everybody else, whatever the majority would like to believe. There has to be verifiable facts. And yet, this is where we are today, all right, around the world, that if I imagine, and I, I just saw this this morning, that one of the presidential candidates, Joe Biden, said his intention will be that if a man imagines that he is a woman, all right, and they go to prison, he will be put into a woman's prison. But who started this? Christians. Someone thought that I ought to be a member of a church. You have to baptize me, pastor. You cannot ask questions. You have no right to ask questions. The church has no right. Okay? One pastor told some of my members, he said the pastor has no right or the, and the church members have no right to question or to ask. And how do we know the person got saved? Because they said that they were born again? I point out, if you ask a Mormon, they'll tell you they were born again. You talk to a Roman Catholic, they'll tell you they are born again. Why? Because the Vatican redefined that somewhere in the 1960s. To use the same terminology. Yeah. I came under pressure uh, why? for not accepting certain people as members and, or, or at least baptizing them again. Why? Because I knew from when we, my, not just myself, but the other preachers, when we talked to this person and her daughter, they were Jehovah's Witnesses at heart. They still believe in those same doctrines. And they were trying to persuade others in the Bible study about those doctrines. How can we ever baptize them and join them as members? But how can you ever know this without verifying? This is in direct disobedience to, uh, what was it? I think was it in First Thessalonians chapter 5. Is it? it says, prove all things. Test everything. Okay, now, you notice the same word, uh, the, the same, all right, those words, are, we've been dealing with compound words. Reprove. Now, is it prove all things? Test. Right? Things that don't pass the test or that fail the test or whatever, what happens? We reprove, we point out there's a problem. Oh, come on. You, all of you do this all the time. Right, ladies? You go to the market. What do you do? You test. And this fish is not fresh. We're not buying this. Isn't it? Right? Anybody you like? Rotten fish. We don't. We test that this is no good. Oh, this one, the, uh, this is rotten. We're not, we're not buying this. The, the banana is squishy already. No, no, we're not buying this. All right? Oh, the pineapple, very nice color, but it's fermented. <laughs> Overripe. No, thank you. Prove all things. All right? Hold fast that which is good. What happens? We only accept those that pass a test of excellence. All right? This is what? Abstain from all appearance of evil. So what happens now? That is a very unpopular passage today. Why? Because in the light of positive only Christianity, we, re we will reject this. What's the underlying mechanism? Why do we think that way? Humanism. We have become very man-centered. 
Why? Because when you prove all things, when you test something, maybe you might offend someone. All right? Someone might be offended. Prove all things. You do, we do that all the time. I go step onto the weighing scale and it's testing me. Isn't it? Yeah, it will test what my weight is. It will report the weight. And I was like, this weighing scale is so negative. <laughs> I will buy a non-judgmental weighing scale. Now, because this has now become the, the way the world operates, we're in serious trouble because why? You cannot effectively operate and function as a doctor without offending someone. Imagine if you tell someone, if you don't stop smoking, you will die. Who are you to judge me? But this is something, the last 2,000 years, this is what we've had to deal with because why? When we come up to the sinner, we say, your sins have separated you between you and your God. That you know what? There is none righteous. No, not one. All right? And that what? The soul that sinned shall die. And we tell them, unless, all right, unless you come in repentance and faith, weapons, you will perish. Today, it won't be long before we will be banned from saying all this. We will have to go underground. Long before that day happens, I think the doctors will have to go on the ground first. Are, you know, it's the end of sports. Why? Oh, uh, we're gonna. We cannot pick. You know, I would be in trouble. Why? Because we, say, we, we cannot pick you for the basketball team. Why? Because every time you receive the ball. You always pass it to the other side. You always make a mistake, you pass it to the other side. You can't dribble and you can't make a shot. We can't use you, but what happens? You can't do that. That's discrimination. Now for me, that's why you know, the Sogi Bill is very frightening because I was trying to look for a definition for what they mean by that they want to end discrimination, but I could not find what was the legal definition for Discrimination. Now that's very frightening because anybody can use that as a weapon against somebody. Yes. All right? Teachers, you will be in trouble. Why? You gave someone an A and you gave someone an F. You discriminated against them. Of course, that's what exams are all about. The question, you see, the question is, and, and this is where we run into this insanity, is that we no longer use our rational common sense to ask, there is a difference between proper, fair discrimination and unfair discrimination. Yes. You get what I'm saying here? There's fair and unfair discrimination. Example would be, when you put everyone to a test or an exam, some will pass and some will not. Some will get an A and some do not deserve an A. But, to do that, you're discriminating now. Um, I think there was a college professor that got in trouble uh, recently in Singapore because this guy, right, he's a foreign uh, lecturer, decided he, he announced and he decided he would give everybody in his class an A, whether they put in effort or not. Okay? Today, it's, it's that way. Is everyone... Um, it's like, we will just give awards because you showed up for the sports meet. Not because you ran the race. Everyone gets a cookie. And we have moved to where all this is based on fantasy, not on reality. Okay? Which means, as a church, you will be, we will get into trouble very quickly because why? you cannot just have a children's nursery or a children's Sunday school. Because what if John comes along and says, I am a golden retriever. <laughs> but you have not catered for that. You're discriminating against us golden retrievers who have two legs. 
And then Gomer comes along and says, but I am an alien from another galaxy, but you have no preaching in my language. I speak an alien language. That's discrimination. No, actually it's, what is that? Those are fables. It's fantasy. All right, the product of man's imagination. And there is no end to this. We, we, we're going there and it's getting worse. And the worst part is it's in our churches also. Because when you and I can insist on a doctrine or whatever with no scriptural basis, except by the word of man, we're in trouble. Okay? They're going to turn their ears away from the truth. Right? And so the, the role of the pastor here in verse 5 was that it says that to watch down in all things, to be watchful, to be vigilant. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. You know, what matters is winning souls. All those things are not important. It says watch down in all things. A callous man needs to resign and step down from the pulpit. He doesn't, he's not qualified to be a pastor. We're supposed to be vigilant men. That's what a shepherd is supposed to be. Watchful. Always aware of dangers. Moms, you know that. Why? They did a study, I think it was just published recently, a few weeks ago. They said it's true. There's something about men that when the baby is asleep, men hear absolutely nothing when they're sleeping. But moms hear everything. Why? I don't know. I can only assume by creation and by design that men and women are wired differently. They hear everything. The baby should... Eh. Do you hear that? Darling, do you, do you hear that? And men are like... Right? The rapture can come and they will still sleep through the whole thing. Didn't miss a thing. Okay, but what happens? It says, moms, you're watchful and everything. It's like, what's going on? You know, now, when you have, when you are a parent, right, even as a father, you, you actually do, you don't do what children do. Children will play, they will do things for now. Parents, as an adult, what do you do? We see our children playing and we're looking at three steps ahead what's going to happen. And we know, aha, you're going to trip, you're going to fall and then sometimes the only thing I can do is maybe just stick my leg out to make sure that they don't, they don't hit the ground and I block, the, I block their fall. Why? We read three or four steps ahead. If you're vigilant and not reading the newspaper or checking your, your Facebook all right. Now the pastor is supposed to be what? To watch down in all things, to endure afflictions because guess what? Being in the ministry is not going to be an easy ride. There will be problems. There will be trouble. There will be opposition. There will be those who hate you. Right? And he says endure afflictions. He told Timothy elsewhere what? To endure that what? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, as a soldier, what happened was this. I, I was trained in the military to sleep anywhere. A hole in the ground is good enough. Anywhere, anytime. My most fond memory was when I was on a hillside, on a slope, right? And I'm sleeping, hit here. My feet are here. And it's raining all night. We have an ambush mission. Through the night, I'm sleeping and the rain is falling on my face. The water that was coming down the hill went into my collar, came out from my boots. All night. When you go to the CR weapons, steam comes up. That's how cold it gets in the jungle. And... It's our job. It's what we're trained to do. All right? Uh, we don't, oh, well, the sun is too hot. Well, it's going to affect my complexion and whatever. Okay? Because the number one thing in Korea 
that the men who do military service buy is skincare products. Seriously. Oh, make sure it's soft, it's moist, you know, whatever. You know what? We didn't care because we're going to be baked, we're going to be dark, or sometimes our skin is good, you're going to look leathery. Why? As a soldier. We were digging into the ground, we we're not worried about, oh, I broke my fingernail, you know, have a. Oh. Is this here? Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. The work of an evangelist is not just to preach the gospel, but to continue to faithfully, diligently deal with this until people actually get saved, not just that they made a profession and they made a decision and they raised their hands. Why? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, because why? We baptize disciples not professors. Titus, at the end of Titus chapter 1, it tells us that, you know what, there are those that profess that they know God, but what happens? In works, they deny Him. Right? Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. That does, is the opposite of a disciple. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will be saved. Matthew chapter 7. Now, so here the thing says, to do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Right? These are final words, for it says, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Now, he would not say that he has fought a good fight if there was no opposition and resistance. Okay? And here he fought a good fight. I have finished my cause. I have kept the faith. Now, that last phrase always gets to me because why? That there are those that start with a good fight. They don't finish their cause because of a lot of issues, greed, compromise, seeking to be uh, to please other men, all right? Becoming a politician rather than a preacher. Now, I've been trying to guard that very carefully from the first time I started to travel overseas and I had invitations to preach. Because why? It is not my goal here to establish in Siem Reap, a Pastor Jesse fan club. Okay? No, because it, one small thing leads to another. Initially, we start signing Bibles. Next thing, we, I don't know what else, right? Then the pictures, there's this, that. Next thing, there'll be a banner, poster, all right? And after a while, you know what? I'm, you, you know, the, the preacher can, after a while, be no different from a K pop star. And we, we need to finish our cause, but it is, he says it's my cause, it's individual. Everyone, what every preacher, every member will go through is different. You, you have to finish. Some have become shipwrecked. Some have abandoned or forsaken. Why? Because they're having, uh, they loved other things. But here it says, I have kept the faith. Why? Because not everyone did. Some have not kept the faith. Some have abandoned that. Some have turned aside to fables instead of holding to the truth. Now, why do we deal with this? Paul foresee, could foresee that these things would happen. That's why he sounded the warning. In the epistles, as you go through the pastoral epistles, right? First, second Timothy, and then you go through, you know, John's epistles, Peter, you will see what? Increasingly, the warnings became more and more urgent. Why? It was already happening 2,000 years ago. While the, these apostles were still alive, they saw this happening among them. 
And what happens today is that, you see, we have lulled ourselves into thinking, nah, that was a long, long time ago. It's not happening today. When the truth is, it's gotten worse. And there is a need to, right, contend for the faith and then what? To keep the faith. Now, you don't lose the faith. but we can hand it over to someone else. We can hand it over to the world. We can hand it over to the compromisers and the false teachers and to the wolves in preacher's clothing. And he had to fight. The shepherd has to fight to fend off wolves. That's his job. As members, I, uh, let me uh, encourage you about one thing. I will just say it because I, and I'm not saying it for the benefit of the pastor. I'm pointing it out as a fact that the pastor is always going to face things that are very hard for members to understand. Okay? And one of the reasons is because, and okay, we, we, we didn't get a chance to go into Acts chapter 20 was that the wolves wear disguises. Sometimes the pastor, if given grace and wisdom, he can discern and see through the disguise. Other times, the wolves remove the disguise when dealing with the pastor. But the members, the sheep, don't see that. The disguise is on, the mask is there. And because of that, the problem sometimes, many times that it happens is that members listen to the wolves because why? They base it on their experience. Because of the wolf who is in a disguise, they hear, but they don't see what the pastor sees. They don't hear his warning because my experience tells me otherwise. You see, that's what makes it so dangerous. Okay, what makes it dangerous is that there are things that well we cannot see. It doesn't mean it's not there. Okay, R recently we are uh, in Singapore. We're having this bad problem with uh, okay, with the air quality right now because uh, okay, I think Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and I think was it Jakarta have now become the most polluted cities in the world just overnight, just over the last few weeks, because of all the burning in Indonesia and the, uh, the cities are in a mess right now. Okay? Now, so I went to look for some of these made in China uh, air quality detectors and whatever to monitor and to measure, right? Now, one of the things uh, I found was that I saw also was that it was possible to measure carbon monoxide. And then you can get the reading of the carbon monoxide levels. Now, carbon monoxide is very interesting because it only takes a few millions of a part to cause problems even though in this room we cannot smell it we cannot see it and if you just increase the amount just slightly it can start killing a whole bunch of us maybe the children will be the first to go but just because we can't see or feel doesn't mean that there is no danger now who is the one that can see everything it's the Lord. Right? It's the Lord. And so, one of the things is, even for the pastors, is that pray for them that the Lord continues to give them wisdom and discernment. Because why? The Lord who can see, and who can see what is on the inside, not just on the outside, is the one that can warn us about dangers. Okay? Now, this is true for everyone because song leaders pray for wisdom and discernment because sometimes just because we pick the song and it comes from the hymnal doesn't mean that it's going to be okay. You've got to look at the words. I shared uh, this morning also during breakfast that we had two versions of a hymn and that when we look at the words on one particular line, uh, that the original version was correct. 
okay? Uh, I think it was a rock of ages, okay? Be of sin, the double cure, save, save me from its guilt and power because when we are justified, the moment we got saved, we're saved from the guilt of sin, right? It's all placed on Christ. His righteousness was imputed to us, right? God declares, in justification, God declares what? The guilty sinner, not guilty. We're saved from his guilt. And then, Romans chapter 6, he said, after we're saved, he said, we are saved, we're still being saved from the power of sin. Okay? But there was a second version which made its way into a number of hymn books that uh, spoke of it differently, that we, we can be cleansed and made, be made pure. And this was actually, a, uh, as I read also, on, on in, I looked it up on Google, that that second version kind of favored Methodist theology. And it, it, with the Methodists, uh, they do teach, the old-time Methodists will teach that you can become sinlessly perfect in this lifetime. That's error. Okay? Now, we have to be vigilant and, and sometimes only the Lord can get your attention on things. But here, in his final words, right, Paul also points out that henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Now, there is a reward, a crown of righteousness. right? The Lord, who is the righteous judge, sees and knows everything. Okay? He sees and knows everything. Teachers, you know, sometimes the most well behaved and best student in class is putting on an act because when you ask the other students, they'll tell you they only do that when you are around. But when you're not around, boy, are they a devil. The righteous judge knows the difference. Right, serve the Lord faithfully. It doesn't matter if you don't get praises, that you don't get uh, acknowledgement. Because why? There is a righteous judge who will hand out the proper awards one day. Amen. Right? I always make it a point to point out and to praise the members who have been serving behind the scenes that don't get seen by anyone else. Amen. Why? To remind everyone, don't worry about it. Even if there is no acknowledgement, you know what? That job that nobody saw you do is just as important. And someday there is a righteous judge who will give out the proper reward for that. All right? Now, why did Paul go through all this trouble? Right? He, he, he had to what? Notice, fight a good fight. He had to endure afflictions. Why? Because he says there will be a crown of righteousness. That he says the Lord will give. He says not just to Paul. It's not just for special people or that those who are called to the ministry. But he says not only to, shall give me that day, not to me only, but it says what unto all them also that love His appearing. Now he makes the connection that this kind of carefulness, vigilance, and all that has to do with the fact that the Lord is coming back soon. And that things, the way things are will get worse and worse before the Lord comes back. And that's why it says here, all those who are vigilant, who are careful, who are watchful, this, they, this is the crown of righteousness. This is what is waiting for them. You see, this is, in other words, this is not just something optional. Well, okay, I understand, you know, you, you've, you know, risen, you're very careful about all this stuff, but that's because, you know, you are a super Christian, you are more spiritual than all the other people in church, whatever. No, 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 no. This is something that we should strive for. Not just a special class, right? A crown of righteousness. Now, here's the problem. This award says what? It's for what? Righteousness. We are in a mess that we are today across the whole landscape because pastors, members, 
entire churches or even groups no longer love righteousness. It's no longer important to us. That's why we are in the state that we're in. You see, the, the issue is not about your righteousness or mine, my, our, our self-righteousness. Paul's goal was that he would be able to stand before him, before the Lord Jesus Christ, to be found not having my own righteousness, but what? Having the righteousness of Christ, of God, who is by faith. Now, here, the, all these things have to do with the fact that it's not just stuff that we do in order to, well, we want to have a better church ministry, a program, whatever. It's, the basis was this, we love righteousness. But you and I cannot love righteousness unless you've been born again and made into a child of God who has now received the righteousness of Christ. Because if we love righteousness, we will not joke about sin and wickedness and all these things. I know over the last five years, actually, uh, I've got a lot more white hair. I think yesterday when Pastor Joel was talking to me, uh, he added a lot more. Because he was telling me when the, the preachers that he knew, some of them, when they gathered together, all they do is talk and brag about their wickedness. Here, you have to understand that our Lord died because of unrighteousness for your sake and mine and there is no way that if you and I are born again we're saved right that we could ever love unrighteousness okay now we are not and will never be sinlessly perfect in this life right that will change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye instantly when we receive an immortal resurrection body but that Christ's nature, that new creature is made in righteousness. It loves righteousness. We will never bend the truth. How can we ever, you know, I, I, I pointed this out to our members before. I said, how can we love private meetings and having things done in the shadows when as children of light, there is no such thing as shadows. All right, is it everyone? I, I, I can't remember the, the verse, but every man you know, that loves the light, what happens? They said, We will want to be manifest, we will want to be out there, open, transparent before all. Where is this business where, oh, I'm the pastor, you know, I, I don't need to tell you everything. I may not always be able to explain everything, but I will want you to know about things. All right? And I, at a very fundamental level, this is where the problem is. We no longer love righteousness. Okay, we've gone away from that. And once you get used to the shadows or the gray areas, after a while, it doesn't surprise me that whether it's in an online discussion or face-to-face or -face gathering of pastors or whatever, that it seems like the saints no longer know what is right or wrong anymore. They don't seem to be certain about anything. Why? Because we have moved away from this as the foundation. Okay? And so, one of the very fundamental things that when we get saved is that our relationship with the Word of God is change. We love this. You cannot fake it. No one can train you to do this. There is a desire and it's innate. Okay? Babies have to drink milk. They're hungry. The moment the baby is born, the hunger is there. It's unmistakable. That's one of the reasons I knew when my daughter Amy was born that she's alive. That was a hunger. Unmistakable. What the struggle that went on for the next few days was no baby is born knowing exactly 
having a perfected skill as to how to drink from the mother. Mom has to learn how to feed the child. The baby has to learn how to nurse and drink from mom. That was a skill. The hunger is always there. You are, if you're alive, the hunger is there. Unless the baby was born, stillborn, dead. Okay? As a child of God, understand that that hunger is not just for the word of God, but for righteousness. Right? And that Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ himself said that, well, that there is a blessing. Right? Blessed are ye that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? Because he's going to fill us. If we love righteousness, what will happen? Reproof will come naturally. Okay? We will point things out. Not because we do it to prove that we are more spiritual than others or that I am more correct than someone else because that's pride. Okay? But because we have a love desire for the brethren, right? And that we, because of love, we, we point things out. Okay? As much, I know, as, as much as it's very tempting for parents sometimes, like, oh, you want to do that? Go ahead, go ahead. We'll see. At most you die. Deep down we know. We say that, sometimes you, you might be tempted to say that, but deep down you know, I don't want my child to die. I don't want them to do something stupid. Right? And so we will warn, we will uh, rebuke and even chastise our children. And so when you, when you see this, realize that the ministry of reproof and warning is very fundamental and very much needed in New Testament churches today who, and that the majority of churches have neglected this. Why? Because we have chosen an emotional, okay, to satisfy the emotional lust for, you know, I just want nice, sweet things from the Bible, all the positive things. That's how people read the Psalms. But they ignore the past that where, Pete, where David called for the Lord to deal with the enemies or the unrighteous and the wicked. Right, we read all the others, the Lord is my shepherd. Okay, and even, even Psalm 23. Don't you remember David talked about what? The rod. That shepherd's rod. What was the comfort there? Where even if I go wrong, that rod will direct me back. It will be used on me. And that was comforting. Parents, I hope you, you got that tip. Right? That the most insecure children are those who have never been dealt with by their parents. Okay? The ones when we deal with them properly, they, yes, it's painful, they'll cry, whatever, but after that, they're very well adjusted, they're fine. They're back to normal. Okay? You see, we pick and choose what we want to read. Why? Because of our own lust. Because we're men sent. We want what pleases us, what pleases the flesh, instead of the truth. And the truth will hurt. Brethren, how many times have you read the Bible? You know what? Many times I read this, there are things that I don't want to read in there. You know why? It says something about me that I don't like. I have to be honest about it and deal with it. Just as as a church, we have to be honest about it and to deal with this. Okay? And pastors have to be honest. But, you see, you can't have a pastor who is honest if he's not accountable to anyone. We, we like, okay, people like to say, well, I'm only accountable to God, but the question is this. Anyone who says that, all right, maybe it's someone here, you say that, can I ask you, when was the last time you wept over your sin when you read the Word of God? 
that you realize, you know what, I can preach this, but this was pointed at me. This was about me. And I need to deal with this. Right? And that happens every time, you know, it ought to happen whenever we open and read the scriptures. If you wept over that, you were reproved already by the word of God. Sometimes rebuked about what we've been doing or what we're pretending that no one else could see. But when we get that right and we settle that before the Lord, you know what? It is comforting and there is joy and we grow. All right? So let me encourage everyone here that, you know, the Word of God is not just there to, when we preach it, that this is something that, you know, for the pastor to keep score, how everyone is responding, how many people come forward, all that, oh, I must be doing okay. This is for us, is to build us up, right? To point out where we're headed the wrong direction, to rebuke us so that we can correct Right? And, and then to encourage us, build us up. Okay? Even, and this is to be done all the time, even when it's not popular. I offended a whole bunch of people over the last few years when I pointed out one thing. That, and this, this was very popular in, in Singapore among the Baptists I know and it was even used in our church also, when people say, well, pastor, this is not edifying, which translates to, I didn't like that. Because I didn't like that, it should not be said. It should not be spoken. In other words, that was a, a form of political correctness and censorship. Because why? Man decides truth rather than God. If God settles the truth, we have to submit to it even if those are the things we don't like. And there are things, seriously, it still bothers me, I struggle with things. But if God spoke and this is His word, I must, I must humble myself to accept it. But so many times we sit there and we decide, well, I don't like that one. I didn't like that. I didn't think that was edifying. I didn't think that was uh, very encouraging. You know, I didn't think that was very positive. And we, fo- and we don't realize that that is the poison of a lot of very man-centered theology over the centuries. And then, of course, in the last 50 years or more, true charismatism is infiltrated into our churches. Okay? And that now sets the boundary and limit for what should be preached or not when it says here, preach the whole, the word of God. Right? Paul elsewhere said what? The all, whole counsel of God. All of it. Okay? And so, what is your relationship and attitude towards the word of God and towards the counsel of God today? Right? Be Determine that we want as a church to build ourselves up as a church that we are dedicated to that what it says here and we're not interested in what men have to say. Okay? It doesn't matter who. Right? We've got to come back to this. And we won't know what is in here unless you and I resolve that we, not just the pastor or the preachers, that we will study this for ourselves to be able to find answers and we don't know how get training right that I want to get training because someday mom and dad it's not someone they're ministering to whoever it's your children they want to see answers from the Bible the biggest stumbling block in, in as far from my experience in terms of personal evangelism has always been this most people have never met a Christian who seriously, who takes this seriously, who knows how to find 
answers to everything from here. Why? Because the majority of Christians hardly know this book. Right? Ask yourself, how many times in your lifetime so far have you actually read this from cover to cover? And at the very least today, let's start with one goal. Resolve your... I will do this one time, hopefully soon, before I die. Instead of what? Just picking and choosing things. Moment that you know, our kids, according to their own lusts, will pick and choose. I don't want to eat the vegetables. Right? I only want the meat. Or I only want the rice. Right? But I don't want this to eat. This is yucky. I don't like this. What do we do? You eat all of it. Why? Because it's good for you. Right? It's good for you. What happens when we just let them pick and choose what they want? It's going to be a disaster. Right? Uh, one lawyer told me this. One child, by the age of nine, the body was permanently damaged. Because why? This child said, I only want to drink milk. Never ate solids. By nine years old, all growth was permanently stunted. There was no, nothing that could be done to reverse this. Why? Because we give in to what people want. Okay? Uh, I think last week there was the news somebody died, I think, because the mom and dad gave in to this teenager who ate only certain things, didn't eat anything else, and died. Okay, not because this is poisonous, but there has to be a balance in everything, and, and we need all the counsel of God, not just some. Even if it's not popular, even if your friends mock you, right? This stays. No one, because if you believe that not everything should be applied, not we don't need to hold to all of it. Then why don't you tear that out from your Bible? Tear it out. None of us dare to do it. But mentally, that's what we do. You need to tear it out. Take it out. If you don't think that it should be applied. Otherwise, if you're going to leave it in, then take it seriously. Okay? So, let's break here. I just want to kind of set our thoughts and our hearts here on some things that are important. And realize this, we are in those days. Paul's warning not, wasn't just prophetic, it has been fulfilled and still being fulfilled even today. And that's why we need to take heed because there was a very solemn charge before the Lord Jesus Christ and before the Father that these are things that are important to the churches. Right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time.